Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Blog Talk Radio. My name is Dr. Michael Rice, and I'm the Forgiveness Doctor. Uh, Jeannie isn't introducing our show today because she's out in the boonies where she doesn't have any cell service out in uh, the desert in California. I'm in the big city of Pahrump, Nevada, where we're doing a series of workshops and, uh, and carrying on the work in Nevada here. Welcome to the show, and uh, David's on the line. David, do we have anybody else on the line, do you know? Well, let's see. We do have a couple of people that are listening in. We have a couple of guests, and I'm watching the chat room to see if someone has any questions or thoughts. And so far, well, then there aren't any. Um, so I'm just, I'm here. I'm here doing three things at once, learning how to do all of this at the same time. So I'm glad you're there to, to fill some things in. And uh, for those of that are tuning in maybe for the first time, this is Mind Shifters Talk Radio. Um, and Dr. Michael Rice is the forgiveness doctor. And we'll be talking about forgiveness again today. What do you think? Well, I think that's an excellent idea. We're here to support every mind, heart, and being. That's our purpose in doing this show, is to give people support in using the tools of forgiveness. And as we use the tools of forgiveness, we get a chance to change what happens inside of us. Nothing to do with what's happening outside of us, but rather changing what's inside of us. If you have any questions, any thoughts, you can listen to the show as well, and uh, if you just hit a one, that'll put you into a queue so that uh, you'll be able to speak to us and uh, ask your questions. You can call us at 646-200-4169. That's 646-200-4169. You can also go to our website, www.whyagain.com, and uh, all the tools that we'll be talking about are there on the website. You can access them freely. Under the uh, label of uh, download worksheets, you'll see the worksheets there that uh, refer to uh, many of the different tools that we work with and that we are uh, in the process of moving towards the world. We had an exciting time in um, Las Vegas, Nevada last night. We had about uh, 20 Spanish-speaking people and did a Spanish uh, a workshop, a Why Is This Happening to Me Again workshop, with uh, Claudia Andraki, who's the wife of Dr. Andraki, who's sponsoring us here. And it was a very rewarding uh, evening. There were several young men there who uh, who just really were able to hear the message of uh, how to change what's happening inside of us rather than focusing with the outer eye and looking outside of us. So it was pretty, uh, pretty neat to uh, start to move this in the direction of the Spanish community on another level. Of course, the book Why Is This Happening to Me Again is available in Spanish on our website freely. You can download it and in English and German and Russian and Farsi. Uh, Thai is underway. There are several translations that we've got underway as well. So you're welcome to go to the website and pick those things up. We offer them freely. We're delighted you're with us. And uh, is Jeannie uh, communicating anything there? We won't hear her voice today, but uh, David is um, relaying messages out of the chat room if there's anything to, uh, to share from Jeannie's end. David? There's nothing so far. We do have Dr. Tim that's on, and um, so uh, as far as anyone else, there are several people that's in the chat room and online, and so far no questions, though, about what it is that we like, they might like to talk about today. You know, it's interesting that, uh, that this whole idea about uh, – doing, you know, putting the pen to the paper is, as you refer to it and, and doing our work. And I thought it was so powerful yesterday that Connie, uh, there were several people that commented to me later about her testimony, how strong that that was. And it really is a, a, a reflection of, wow, you know what? It all shifts, it all changes once that we make the commitment and then take the action. You know, it takes the commitment, then it takes the action of doing that work, and everything does start to shift. I mean, what a powerful testimony by a lady that that, that merely just listen, and then through, do, through doing the listening, then she went with the worksheets and did things. So everyone has a different style and way of learning and absorbing things, and I think that, the, that we intuitively know what that is, 
And, and if we would just tap into that, whether it is listening or watching a DVD or doing a worksheet or talking to someone or even listening to this radio show, because that is what it's all about. What we're here for is to support people in having that space to take a look. Without taking a look, without putting anything into action, though, it's going to stay the same. It really is. So our support and our encouragement is that you will motivate yourself in order to uh, maybe even come on here and ask a question or grab a worksheet and do a worksheet, whatever that it is, so that you can make the shift, just like Connie and her friend did. So maybe that that might be something. Uh, nothing in the chat room as of yet. So hey, yesterday, uh, if anybody wants to tap into the archives from yesterday, it was a really awesome show. There were several people who called in talking about uh, the, the just the uh, what in the world's terms would be unbelievable changes uh, that they've experienced by using the work. And today, I had the thought of uh, of beginning our show out and looking at uh, something that's occupying a lot of the world mind. And yesterday, we talked about how the world structures us into looking through the outer eye and thinking that what's out there is real rather than realizing that what's out there is an effect. And uh, there's a quote that was written just a month after 9-11 in 2001, and uh, it's from a Buddhist monk named Thich Nhat Hanh. And here's what he says, and and, and you just think about how terror is just so, uh, this whole terror idea is being used to terrorize people, uh, interesting that in the name of healing or, or protecting ourselves, we're terrorizing people left, right, center, up, down, you know, invasive x-rays, uh, full body x-rays, physicians saying, I wouldn't go in that box if I was paid to. Uh, the, the people who are in officialdom are, are staying away from it, but everybody else is subject to the the uh, kind of, just there's so much craziness in the name of protecting ourselves. But here's what Thich Nhat Hanh says. He says, terror is in the human heart. We must remove this from the heart, which, of course, we could add is the Aramaic definition of forgiveness, because it is destroying the human heart, both physically and psychologically, and is what we should avoid. The root of terrorism is hatred, misunderstanding, and violence. This root cannot be located by the military. Bombs and missiles cannot reach it, let alone destroy it. Only with the practice of calming and looking deeply within can our insight reveal and identify this root. Only with the practice of deep listening and compassion can it be transformed and removed. Darkness cannot be dissipated with more darkness. More darkness will only make the darkness thicker. Only light can dissipate darkness. Those of us who have light should display the light and offer it so that the world will not sink into total darkness. And... There's nothing to believe. Uh, you know, people talk, well, what do you believe in? And this isn't about believing in something. This is about an action you can take. This is about taking responsibility for your own heart, for your own life, and what's going on inside of you, and changing the content of your own mind. If we get a mind in darkness that can take over another mind who falls into darkness, that takes over another and another, and we hit a critical mass of darkness, no amount of violence will get rid of that. No bombs, no, no amount of money spent in uh, trying to get rid of the bad guys is going to change the darkness that's in the hearts of those who are trapped in darkness. So to accomplish the result of healing, rather than being about belief, is to recognize there's an ancient work to be done. And this is the work of true healing, and this is what we are bringing forward to the planet. We, and fortunately, many others today. So... The the non-being mind wants nothing to do with this difficult work. It is a challenge. And, you know, we find the non-being mind is that mind based in hostility and fear. And it says, no, all I have to do is go kill the bad guys. All I have to do is punish somebody enough, and then the darkness will go away. And not recognizing that the act of murder, that the act of darkness simply brings more of the same, every mind who joins in that darkness strengthens that which shields us from the light, and each mind can bring forward the light that is in them. You go back to the ancient Aramaic and the word Yeshua said the, 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 the light, that he was the light of the world, and then he used exactly the same words except for the pronoun, and he said, you are the light of the world. 
And we do not bring forward our light by entertaining thoughts of fear, of hostility, of grief, of reproach, of punishment. We change and shift out of darkness by engaging in the activities that remove that darkness. That is the work, and not an easy work. So non-being, the mind of hostility or fear, is a familiar state, and when it's comfortable in its familiar state, it likes the things that keep it there. It's time for a change. Michael? Yes, sir. Excuse me, Michael? Yeah. Go ahead. A couple of questions from the ch- couple of questions from the chat room. One is a young lady who says she's doing her work around her relationship issues, but really wants to be in a relationship. She's from a culture where the, um, where women uh, are to be submissive and pretty and smart and to be proud and uh, to be a proud asset to have on his arm. And um, so she would like to, be, to make some comments about that. And then someone else says uh, she wants to know what her healing will look like when she is clearing her power person dynamics. So there's a couple of uh, topics there. Well, let's go with the, uh, the power person dynamics first uh, because it's a real simple process, is that when you start looking at your body-mind unit as an energy system rather than a physical thing, then you realize that whatever energy goes in that does not belong in the system, that is disintegrative energy, if it's not dealt with and processed out, forgiven, then it becomes locked in tissue. On the way in, it creates symptoms. The symptoms are whatever is unlike uh, comfort, uh, the presence of love. As you go through the healing process, you will dig those things back out. On the way out, they'll look exactly as they looked on the way in. Healing is not Dr. Feelgood. And that's why a lot of people won't engage in it, because they figure, once I've locked this in, then I, now I don't have to deal with it anymore. But what they're doing is dealing with it on a destructive physical level. And so as you step in and begin to heal, those symptoms on a physical level are going to look like any kind of physical symptom you've ever had, and low energy. And the low energy because the structure has to take apart the disintegrative structures in the, in, in the body-mind unit and rebuild. So it takes energy to do that. So low energy is a step in the process. On a mental level, it looks like any kind of negative thought you've ever had and confusion. Why? Because the old conflicting mind energy when it comes to the surface, especially if you're engaging in something new and constructive, those are energies that, just like uh, competing radio stations, create a flip back and forth and confusion in the mind. That's a normal state for healing. And then on a, an emotional level, healing is going to look like any kind of negative thought you've ever had and depression. And so the, the idea of healing is to keep pouring light into those areas of darkness as they splash up and out of the system. It's not Dr. Feelgood, but it is. there is a reliable, systematic way that you can do that process and come up and out the other side of the hostility and fear. And that's exactly what we're looking to support people in doing. So does that make sense? Uh, if, if you have any comments in the chat room on that, uh, the person who asked the question, if you want to uh, refine your question at all or... There's no, there's nothing so far, Michael, with that, and um, you know I think that that's, uh, that says it exactly what it is that goes on, and it's kind of like you know when we first recognize that there is something, then there's a real uh, uh, loss of energy, not not so much a loss, you know there was energy that that was kind of holding on to that belief, and then went to see it differently. It's like there's this freeing up of that energy, and sometimes, as you said, but then there's a there's that that sense and that feeling of a low energy, or, uh, because there was energy that that had been applied to it to hold it in place. Does that, does that sound accurate? Yep, definitely, uh, definitely on track. And so, other question in the chat room, if you'd read that one over again, David. Okay, uh, there was one. The lady said that. Uh, Wait a minute. Oh, 
uh, Jimmy is implying that I, I think maybe that 646-200-4169 is the call number if someone would like to call in. And uh, it was an email from a young lady who said doing, that doing her who is doing her work around her relationship issues but really wants to be in a relationship. Uh, kind of To me, it kind of sounds like, well, I, I want to be in a relationship and don't want to be in the relationship. And she's from a culture where women, uh, is, uh, it is to be there to be submissive, pretty, and smart, and, and then to uh, be an asset. And so that, that's the other question that's in there. So it, it sounds to me like, what uh, what she's saying is that, um, or I'll say what you're saying is that um, you really want to be in a relationship, but it sounds like your culture's definition of relationship is that you become an object and a possession, and that you're really not interested in going there. And so my input would be that you might want to start to do some some forgiveness work around the cultural idea that to be a woman is to be a possession and uh, to be an object uh, rather than to be a being. And uh, sadly, mm -hmm. there's been a, uh, a lot of objectification, especially of women, men as well, but not as much, but a lot of objectification of women, that, that a woman has been turned into an object and in so doing, ignoring the being that's there and creating an inferior status so it's going to be awkward if you hold that being in a relationship means that I'm going to be in inferior status and I want to be in a relationship. It's certainly conflicting. So I'd suggest that uh, perhaps working the worksheet process, and if you don't have the worksheet in hand, you can go to www.whyagain.com, and on the right-hand side you'll see a section that says Download Worksheets. If you click there, the first item under that section is a set of instructions for how to use the worksheet. The second item is the worksheet itself. I'd suggest that you take the worksheet and if you uh, if you don't know how to fill it out, the instructions are there and or there's an archive. We did actually a, a whole show where we walked a young lady named Pam Gregory through the process of the worksheet. She was a, a willing volunteer. And you can listen to those instructions if you just go to the archives. I believe that uh, Jeannie has labeled that as a, uh, a sample worksheet, and you can hear us give instructions for that. So we invite you, uh, rather than us redoing that show or redoing the worksheet process and its instructions now, we would invite you to listen to that. And as you begin to work with the worksheet, absolutely, if there are any questions, we'd love to refine and uh, give further support in understanding how the worksheet process operates. But I'd say they'd be the two areas to start looking for uh, a okay. shift in your Okay. Two things, Michael. One, there's like a feedback that's coming through. I don't know if it's from my phone or from yours. It's almost like that there is a printer that's running, one of those old kind of printers that, you know, really running back and forth. I don't know if it's coming from your end or mine. And uh, there was the reply that's was that she's getting... Yeah, that's better. Much better. Okay. Uh, the reply is that she's getting out of a really bad relationship and does not want to repeat it. And with the language that we talk about in regulatory speech, uh, first thing that I noticed there, there was the, the language of and does not want to repeat it, which just sets up that dynamic to, to do the same thing. And I think, uh, you know, the idea of her doing worksheets around what... Um, relationships are about and of course there's several tools in order to do that the codependency may be a, a real good tool for her with that so that was the reply on that uh, uh, well, and move so forward, far David, there's nothing else that's come in before you move forward uh, the other thing that I would suggest is that you go to the website uh, again under download worksheets or actually on the left hand side of the home page you'll see a uh, a listing for the commitment, my commitment. And I'd suggest that you download the first person commitment, one that you use with yourself in the mirror, and also uh, the copy of the commitment to use with other people. And as you see yourself being able to treat yourself the way that commitment invites you to treat yourself, you will tend more and more to be able to resonate or attract someone in who's capable 
of living in relationship on that level. And, you know, if you've been in a relationship that was difficult and it sounds like perhaps abusive, it's going to take some time to work through the energies accumulated from that and to work out of this is what I don't want and to be really clear on what it is that you do want. And as you get clear on that, everything once again starts to change. And it changes in the direction of human life. And human life, I would offer, is the active presence of love. And the basic thing that we're working to to do is to support people engaging in their world in such a way that they produce a human life. That is, the active presence of love, 24-7, 365, no matter what's happening in your world. And as you do that, you tend to resonate those people who are in tune with your human life. If you've been trained into being an object, and that's how you've come to think of yourself, then it will be difficult to resonate or draw somebody into your, your, uh, your world that sees you as something other than an object. So you have to, I might say, uh, de-objectify yourself. You have to remove from your field the belief in yourself as an object. And that in itself is a major piece of work, to, uh, to step out of that, um, that mindset and to experience yourself totally and completely as the awesome presence of love that you are and the commitment uh, that we invite people to engage in with themselves and with each other is a learning process to integrate it's not something that is uh, what should I say it's, it's not something that's normal for people to do in this culture because we've been trained in something much different than living a true human life. And so as you recognize that, everything starts to shift. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to share the commitment with you, the young lady that's that's written that question. And I'll just invite you to get into a quiet, receptive space and imagine yourself, if you would, being able to create a relationship where the person who's in relationship with you thinks of you in this way and is willing to behave with you in this way. And so I'm going to speak this directly to you. Anybody else that wants to just tap in and and be part of this energy, please just tap into it. So I promise to trust you enough to tell you the truth and be true to you. I commit to always be sweetness in your life to nurture you daily and treat you lovingly, gently, and with respect. In my thoughts, my words, and my actions, whether I'm in your presence or not, in every interaction I commit to affection for you, to look for and acknowledge the highest and best in you, and surrender to love, our true nature. My connection to my source, my relationship with you, And our serenity will always be more important than any issue. I open my heart to embrace you in my love. I open my heart to be embraced in your love. If anything unlike love comes up, I will hold this in my heart and listen. As we each learn to speak, experience, and be responsible for our own realities. I'm here for and with you keeping communication open, and keeping love conscious, active, and present as we heal, celebrate life, and grow together. So that's my commitment to you. And I invite you to imagine now yourself looking in the mirror and you're speaking to yourself. And here's the the, the work I would invite you to do would be the willingness to work through everything that would be unlike living this commitment totally and completely with yourself. I promise to trust myself enough to be willing to hear and speak the truth and treat myself lovingly, gently, 
and with respect in my thoughts, my words, and my actions all the time. In every interaction, I will look for and acknowledge the highest and best in myself as I surrender to love, my true nature. Staying connected to my source, love, and nurturing that relationship is more important to me, more important than any issue. If anything unlike love comes up, I will go to that quiet place within where love dwells. I'll listen to, welcome, and accept love's guidance. I'll be teachable as I ask to be inclined toward healing and shown how to keep communication open in all relationships. I'm willing to speak, experience, and be responsible for my own realities and learn to keep love conscious, active, and present as I heal and celebrate life. Those commitments are both on the website. I'd invite you to download them. I'd especially invite you to use that commitment to yourself, the second one, in the mirror every day. Until your natural response is, well, of course that's the way I treat myself. How else would I do it? So does that bring any, over any comments in the chat room, David? There are no comments so far with that. I would imagine my sense is, is that people are kind of absorbing that. You know, those are two very powerful statements and um, just in taking that action as you talk, uh, as you invited people to do, my sense is, is that as soon as someone does it, at least this was my experience, in doing it, everything just comes up. You know, it's, it is a tool to be able to use and to have support as you go through it because the mind's going to come up with, as this mind shifter program is about, is to get you to shift into seeing it in a new way. It's going to be arguing for its rights. Nope, it's this way. And, of course, that's what it's all about is to, to me is about getting back to our true essence of who it is that we are. And when we tap into that, then the other things are dissolved. So make a commitment to do that for one day. Just do it for today and then check, us, check in tomorrow and let us know what it was, how it worked for you. Because without taking some action towards it, as Michael said at the beginning, you know, we can have lots of intellectual conversation about it and we can agree and even disagree on an intellectual basis. Uh, and it really, to have a new experience of it, then I have to actually put it into action. So, you know, not being, when that mind of hostility or fear is a familiar state, becomes comfortable. And the working, the work of returning to true being from that perspective seems, uh, seems impossible and very discomforting. You know, people say, well, gee, I, you mean I have to handle everything like fear and hostility in me and, and keep committed to, to living lovingly? That sounds like, that sounds really hard. And my offer to you is that it's not hard. It takes effort. What is hard is living in hostility and fear. However, because it's a natural state for a lot of people, it seems like nothing is required to do it. It's automatic. It's effortless. To go in a different direction takes effort, but, oh, does life get easier. And so that familiar state, if, and, and you look at that word familiar, family, if, if it's the good old family feeling, and you say, I'm, I'm ready to move somewhere else, there can be a part of us that, that gets lost in, well, but now I'm not being true to the family. I'll tell you what. You know, if you go back and you listen to Yeshua, he said, I come to bring a sword to separate father from son and daughter from mother. And he was talking about those good old family feelings that are not based in human life. He was saying, I, I come to separate you from those things that do not support your human life. I come to invite you to live as love, and if your good old family feeling is about hostility, fear, self-deprecation, degradation, bullying, if that's what the good old family feeling is, then the man named Yeshua came to bring a sword to show you how to cut that off and to move back to a true human life. So the truth is that living in fear and hostility is difficult but effortless. It takes work to move in the direction of 
really living in being. It takes one out of one's comfort zone at, fir- zone at first. But, you know, again, if you listen to yesterday's show, you'll hear a couple of folks who uh, who really had lived in that world of hostility and fear and how they shifted and how powerful that is. So we invite you to, to you know, to in the ancient teachings they said, take up your cross. It wasn't about taking up his cross. It was about dealing with what keeps you out of love and removing that. And the removal process is done through the action of forgiveness. So we invite you, you know, to Michael, as, as you were talking, one of the thoughts that came to me is the story that Kim has shared with us on several occasions. And it was one of the, my first thoughts when uh, the request was when the request about, you know, leaving a relationship. One of the uh, exercises is to, as you said, to read the commitment to that person that uh, you were in the relationship with. It uh, doesn't necessarily have to be in front of that person, for it is a, a way of dealing with that while still in the relationship or just getting out of the relationship. I know that in your work, and there have been many times that people would come to an intensive or they would come to one of your workshops and discover this tool. And and this is this is just to suggest that there's different things that could possibly happen, that people were in the process of getting a divorce and they wind up staying together, and or that they were in the process of getting a divorce and continue to get the divorce and did it really lovingly and gently. So, and uh, I remember that Ken's story about the fellow that was reading it to his wife, and actually she wasn't even in her presence. He was just doing it mentally with that. So that's my thought. Yeah, was- There's nothing else in the chat room, is it? Yeah, so go ahead, please. Yeah, that was actually Jeannie who had somebody that she worked with and had given them the commitment. This gentleman was in a a really raucous, crazy relationship and was considering divorce. And uh, he called Jeannie. It was actually a couple of weeks. She had suggested that he read the commitment to her every day. And uh, he called Jeannie and said, I can't believe this. It's just miraculous. My wife and I are getting along for the first time in years. We're, We're happy together. We're having fun together. It's like... This commitment is just remaking our whole relationship. And um, he said, I just I read it to her every day. And she said, well, does she read it back to you? And he was kind of, he kind of stopped and he was in a little bit of shock. He said, what, what, what do you mean? Well, does she read it back to you? He said, oh, she doesn't know I'm doing this. He goes into the bathroom and reads it to her. <laughs> and it's totally transforming their relationship. So it's uh, it's pretty powerful what one person can do when they choose to... Uh, to step out of the no-win existence that so many people believe uh, they're stuck in. You know, if you believe that everybody else is the problem in your life, then, of course, everybody else has to change for you to clean your life up. And once you find yourself uh, at the root of the situations that happen in your life and change the root of that dynamic, all of a sudden, the people around you change. It's miraculous. They're no longer the problem in your life. But when we're in denial, and, and this, this, this mind is such a trickster, when we deny ownership of an energy that we're harming ourselves with, an energy that our tissue structure, our emotions say, ouch, about, we create a literal dissociated state in us. That is, a part of the mind is now hidden from us. And when we don't want to look at that part of our minds, people show up who force us to look at that part of our minds. However, when they show up and resonate that part of us, what happens is we literally build pictures of other people out of what we've dissociated from. And we're sure that what's happening inside of us is caused by them. And once you start to break down that dissociated mind and come back into direct relationship with those dynamics... You change those dynamics. Everything starts to shift. So true. So true. Well, so far, there isn't uh, there isn't anything else that's in there. And I would like to uh, uh, read you something that that uh, was sent to me this morning. It's something that I get on a regular basis. There's several different things. And 
it, to me it flows right into to what we've been talking about, the mental health in action. And it says, whoever plunges bravely into self-discovery may feel at first that he or she is worse off than before uh, and may lose sight and may cite negative traits uh, creating, you know, causing some disappointment or even shock. And this is because he, sees that he or she sees for the first time various traits which controlled him or her without his knowledge. And as that said, unconsciousness, part of it. And surprise comes to every earnest seeker. It is normal and necessary. It is also good news. It is genuine advancement. It is mental health in action, for it includes the curing medicine of honest self-facing. Nothing but good can ever come from these disturbing revelations, regardless of how it feels at the present. It is like the temporary awakeness you feel when learning of a new game. Your very awareness of incapacity becomes an incentive for winning capacity. So just another uh, form of way of saying, you know, that be prepared and know that it is going to come up and just in the act of taking responsibility for that and then that also opens up the space in order to heal that and that's the only way that it's that it's going to evolve and to, to resolve so, and so far there's I, I'm having a good time it's nice that I've learned a little bit more about the uh, how to use uh, the chat room talk with you Look and see who's on here. Kind of read this. Kristen just says, wow, so many guests. And, yeah, Jeannie says, yeah, this is awesome. Anyone have any questions? See, that's always the challenge. We do have these folks out there. Uh, oh, there's Jeannie. Responsibility is able to respond. Yeah, it's the ability to respond to. So we have all of these folks out there. That and, and there are quite a few people that are on. What are the thoughts that are going through your head right now? What are the comments? Are you, you either agree or disagree, or you have something about it? And if you agree with it, great. How about reinforcing it within yourself by sharing it with the rest of the group? That's what the Mind Shifters group is about. It, you know, often when people want to want to have a support group, and they seem to be looking for, and this is my projection of it, for someone that's going to lead them and tell them. And there, there's always going to be a facilitator, someone that's willing to take take charge at that particular time. And it is about feedback from everyone that's participating in it. Because you'll have this when you go to a meeting that it's real easy for one person and everybody just to agree with that person or say enough things. And we really, the way we're going to learn is to see it differently, is to take a risk and to talk about it. So I'm just looking down there to see if there's uh, anyone that has anything that they would like to jump in and say. And so far, I can. Nothing. Not yet. So I, I say I've got okay, something I'd like to throw in the spot into the mix, and that is okay. to uh, be to be able one one of the skills to develop is the ability to step at back from our own minds, and to become the thinker apart from the thought, the feeler apart from the feelings, the actor apart from the actions, and what one finds as you start to observe your good old family feeling, the family dynamics, is that if the family dynamic, which is so common today, involves abandonment, whether the abandonment was real or actual, then oftentimes one feels forced to repeat that pattern in relationship after relationship, situation after situation. And people who are brought up in that through the, uh, the, the body's mind, and remember we've got a higher mind, but through the body's mind, this person can't fathom a world or a relationship where they could actually stay and work through their own issues because the only option they can conceive of is that of blaming others. If you have a, a power person who always harped at you, if you have a power per, had a power person who was, you know, you're stupid, it's your fault, you'll never get anywhere, you'll never do anything, you'll find your mind will want to repeat that pattern and follow the good old family feeling, and you'll find yourself saying things like to a partner, well, you know, it's your fault and you're the problem, and if only you would change and if only you could be different. And that's called blaming somebody else for our own internalized misery. And, and that's the classic oxymoron of the innocent victim. 
There are no innocent victims. There are only volunteers. And the way we volunteer into a situation is by holding a particular energetic pattern in our minds. And, you know, as long as we're in that innocent victim role, I don't care what you do to try to manipulate yourself or others into change. It does nothing to address the internalized misery. You've got to interrupt the pattern. What we're asking people to do is pick up that worksheet, pick up that commitment. If your pattern is to sit there and repeat in your head the ideas, the feelings, the thoughts that your power person gave you about yourself, oh, you're stupid, you'll never amount to anything, you'll never be good enough, you'll never measure up to your brother, you'll never measure up to your sister, you'll never be smart enough, you'll, you know, each one of us, is absolutely born a genius. That's what's true about you, each and every one of you that's listening to this conversation right now. You were born a genius. And if someone else helped you to internalize miserable ideas about yourself, repeating their pattern by blaming your partner because you hold those miserable ideas about yourself will not change them. Pick up that commitment off the website. Look in the mirror and say it to yourself and watch what comes up. And as you commit to yourself to treat yourself lovingly, gently, and with respect, and your mind says, but I don't deserve respect because I'm stupid or whatever was fed to you, that's where you start doing that worksheet process. That's where you fill in and in, in number 1A in the reality management process. You know, maybe it was dad, maybe it was mom, maybe it was an older sister, an older brother, where you fill in in number 1A their name and then you write down, you know, how they tortured you with all these taunts and put downs and how did you feel? Gee, I felt helpless. Well, notice if you fill that in from your childhood that probably today you feel helpless. But you're not helpless. You're a powerful spiritual being. But if your mind's been programmed with something different, it seems like helpless is the order of the day. Well, you know, they're stronger, they're bigger, they've, they're my boss, my, my spouse. That's all garbage. The truth is, you are an absolutely awesome, powerful spiritual being called love. You are not a victim. If victim, you're only victim to what you hold in your own mind. And when you choose to forgive that, when you choose to face that internalized conflict and that internalized story, all of a sudden, you'll look out into the same world and the people that yesterday seemed to be victimizing you will all of a sudden start to acknowledge you because you'll be able to acknowledge yourself. And at that point, there's no need to run away anymore because when we run away, We take the problem with us. The geographic cure is one that never works because when you take the geographic cure, you go along. You take your whole, you know, as Thich Nhat Hanh said, the terror is internal. It's inside of us. And then we externalize it by millions of minds joining in this terror of terror. Stop terrorizing yourself. Stop terrorizing. Hold on, David. Stop terrorizing yourself. It is your own thoughts that terrorize you. Step into a place of confidence and connectedness, and there is a power that will go before you. And that power that will go before you will make straight your path and leave nothing in your way for you to trip on. Nothing you need will be denied you. Not one seeming difficulty, but will melt away before you reach it. When you tap into that power, you need take thought for nothing careless of everything except fulfilling the purpose that you have. And the purpose you have as a human being is to express and to bring into the world the love of God, not the good old family feeling. David, you got a comment or a question there? Yeah, I'm just uh, letting you know that Dr. Kim is, uh, is on the line and has a couple of things that you'd like to share with the group. Hey, good sir. How do you be, Dr. Tim? I'm doing well. Can you hear me? We can hear you loud and clear. For those who don't know Dr. Tim, he facilitates a uh, a mind shifter support group just outside of Chicago in a town called Crystal Lake. And uh, he's a regular presenter on the show. Uh, He's a therapist there that uses this work in his 
his practice and supports people in an awesome way. So what's on your mind today, Tim? Well, I was just listening um, to the discussion, and um, it's been striking me that the core of each of the tools for me is uncovering and showing me the content of my unconscious mind. And as a psychologist, I've had all kinds of different trainings and techniques for 36 years, and they're all focused on trying to get that to happen. And through the course of the years, I've had two or three, sometimes maybe as many as four different events where life spun things around for me quickly, and I got to see the the effect of my unconscious. <laughs> but but it, 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 but that's just three or four times in in my life, even though I've been a psychologist. But since using your tools, particularly the Mind Shifter and the Reality Management Worksheet, it happens weekly, where I get to see what I was hiding from myself that was creating the pain. I was blaming on a situation or a person. And Only David, weekly, Tim? <laughs> Only yeah, weekly? Touch at the least, hem of your garment, my friend. <laughs> at, at least weekly. I'm, 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 I'm not a big exaggerator. <laughs> <laughs> but David keeps talking about the dissociated mind, and I'm certain there are people listening who don't, understand what that means. They don't yet have the brain cells to understand that. But part of that for me is every time my mind says, this is too painful, this is too overwhelming, and it hides it from me, it takes something from my conscious awareness and pushes it into my unconscious, that material becomes dissociated, that blocked from my view. And uh, I recently had a situation where uh, on a Friday night, my son told me that... Very tearfully, he told me that one of his good friends from grade school had committed suicide. Uh, and, this, and this young man was a Marine, and he had a two-year-old daughter, and he was only 22 years old. And and so, and so, he grew up right behind uh, the house that I raised my children in. And then that was on a Friday evening. On a Sunday morning, I had the privilege of going to a welcome home warrior citizen ceremony to welcome back a... Reserve Army Brigade from Afghanistan and Iraq. And I went there and I took, you know, my friend Christy and we were there and we were there to meet the Brigadier General and the Colonel and to be announced to people because some of the work I do helps people with post-traumatic stress disorder. And I was talking to a Lieutenant Colonel and Christy walked up and said, oh yes, and just this weekend we heard about a young Marine who's a good friend of Dr. Hayes whose son took his life. And I... It just absolutely, I almost passed out. I couldn't breathe. I had a lump in my throat. I'd been with her and through this whole ceremony for the past three hours and not once thought about that young man. Yep. And then she mentioned it, and I couldn't finish my next sentence to the lieutenant colonel. Yep. Because it had been, I had just had to dissociate myself from that in order to go and show up as the psychologist and the professional and and the know-it-all, et cetera, And when she said that, I had to excuse myself because I couldn't finish the sentence. And that's just the the kind of example that I used to only get, oh, maybe if I was lucky once every few years, that I would see an example of how my unconscious mind had hidden something from me. Or my conscious, you know, I'm sorry, the, the protective part of my mind had decided to hide something from me in my unconscious. Well, I get those kinds of insights now on a weekly basis by doing worksheets and by being in the Mind Shifter support group and and getting real insight into how I'm creating the pain that I was formerly blaming on someone or something else. Yeah, that's powerful. Well, in in the uh, workshop on creating con- or pardon me, uh, communication, did you hear what I think I said? We we describe a thing called projection communication and in that projection communication game uh, what happens is something comes along that creates pain in us, or that, pardon me, that uh, resonates pain in us, and out of our pain, we have a conversation about somebody else instead of going back into that conversation about ourselves. And uh, 
certainly that um, that type of situation you're describing uh, the I would imagine would be exacerbated by the pain carried by every young man and young woman coming back in that brigade because what they're going through is so outrageously and oh, I'm not even sure what to say grievously insane and no human being should be asked to engage in that kind of energetics and it's certainly a dynamic that we need to shift on planet earth that we need to be responsible for it and we need to be able to change inside of ourselves and others I'll never forget uh, the first time I heard the song Christmas in the Trenches I was driving down the road somebody gave me this CD and I'm playing it and the song Christmas in the Trenches comes on and it's a true story about what happened in the fields of France during World War One, when uh, the um, German soldiers send a, a young man out of the field singing Silent Night. And the Allies respond, and they end up out on the battlefield exchanging gifts and seeing each other as human beings. And the conclusion in that song, and I, I, I had to pull off the road, it touched such a deep place in me. The conclusion of the song was, from a, and it was written by a man who was on the fields that night, was on each end of the rifle were the same. That we're human beings, and when we can stop the projection communication, we can stop the degrading language that we use about others, we can start to see ourselves in them and they in us, and it puts an end to war. And of course, there's a lot of money made, so a lot of people don't want to end that game, but it's time for it to end because the, the human cost is just unbelievable. Unbelievable. And the, 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 the cover up, the number of suicides, the number of. Uh, of uh, violent events in these young men and these young ladies' lives is something we should not be asking for. It's time for it to change. I join you in that. Yeah, I, and I and I you uh, Tim and and certainly support you in. And uh, you know, as you told that tell that story, it touches a place in me that still holds tenderness in some of my own work yet to do. And uh, hopefully it touches that in all of us. And uh, together as we join in holding the space of love, that we each heal a part of the uh, the good old culture's feeling that says, well, you know, what we do is we make war on people. Uh, that's our business. And, uh, and we bring that forward from that uh, dissociated mind for healing and are able to change something totally and completely uh, insane into an opportunity for us to start to function as human beings. Well, I salute you for the work you've done in creating the tools that help me to do that on a regular basis and for this radio show which helps support anybody who wants to start or maintain a group of this nature which just spreads the benefit and... Um, amplifies the benefit for me every time I'm in that group when I get the support from those loving people um, who are all holding the same purpose, which is to stay consciously focused more and more each day on our source as that energy of love. Absolutely, absolutely. And there's a, a real work to be done. And the part of the, uh, the the mind we dissociate from in the ancient teachings, you know, we're, we're bringing this teaching forward from several conceptual languages so that we get a bigger picture and understanding of it. But in the ancient Aramaic teachings, it was called the heart. And, and we've lived for almost 2,000 years without being able to translate that word heart. And it is the unconscious. 
And they said, take care of the heart. And, and what most of the culture teaches us do, get rid of the heart. You know, if something's coming up that's painful, well, just, just go get yourself some Prozac. Just, uh, you know, just drink another fifth of scotch. Uh, just go to war and kill somebody. Then you'll feel better. And they did the exact opposite in the ancient Aramaic. They said, take care of the heart. Look at your unconscious dynamics. You've got to be able to embrace that part. Otherwise, it directs unknowingly our lives. And if we want to change the way our culture and our family systems work, we've got to delve directly into the heart. And, and it, it is awesome when you start to use that worksheet process. It is absolutely awesome. Please, please put the pen to the paper and watch what happens as you open you know in essence the forgiveness process from the aramaic collapses the projections from the dissociated mind and puts you right into that place where you can take care of your own heart or your own unconscious your own dissociated mm -hmm. mind and only then can you change it because once we dissociate from it you can sit around and think about it and contemplate it till the cows come home it's not going to change its content you can choose to, to act differently, to behave differently than what's in it, but until you change its content, you won't act differently. And you can't change its content until you can collapse its projections. And that's exactly what the forgiveness process does. It lets you see that all pain is internal. If I'm in pain, my thoughts are off base. I'm in a creative process that needs to change. And having a conversation about what somebody else did isn't going to help one iota having a conversation about myself and what I've locked out of awareness and what's in need of healing in me is such an awesome process to engage. At first, it's a little awkward. It seems a little difficult. But, oh, the rewards are just so awesome. So, Tim, how did the uh, Brigadier General respond to... Uh, so you're excusing yourself. Was there any more conversation? Or? Well, it's just that, uh, that it was a lieutenant colonel I was in the conversation with, and he, he fully understood because he has had so much experience with the, the people in his command, and this whole gathering was about <clears throat> mobilizing community resources to welcome back and support these young people to give them access to treatments for post-traumatic stress to get them back into the community in a loving way, and so he was very receptive, and um, it, it was it was a very good experience all the way around. Awesome, that's powerful. I was invited to that by a, a, a colonel who had um, her. She's best known for a face-to-face -face confrontation with Saddam Hussein in Iraq, and I've met her through several speaking engagements I've done, and. She's heard me say that I like to help veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder with all of these tools that, that you're using and others that I've used specifically for trauma, and she invited me to this, and she's the one who introduced me to the lieutenant colonel and the brigadier general and, and the senator who were there. So it was very much uh, a, a loving and supportive atmosphere, uh, people focused awesome. on trying to help these soldiers. Well, I certainly open the space for that support, and let's take it to the next level where we don't have to take um, innocent young lives and send them into that type of situation. Now, of course, the non-being mind will say, yes, but what about all the things we need to protect ourselves from? It's all done with smoke and mirrors. It's all an inside job. If we've created an enemy, we're the creators of the enemy. Pogo said it really well, and he was serious. He said, we have found the enemy, and the enemy is us. When we go inside ourselves and clean up what's happening in our own minds, what happens is our enemies start to disappear. Well, yes, but what about those forces over there? Yeah, it's always easier to talk about how it's over there. I got pain. I have pain in me, and I'm having a conversation about somebody over there. If you've got pain in you, why don't you have a conversation about yourself? Responsibility communication. There's a worksheet on the website for how to do that. And that's what we're inviting you to do. And as you do that, you will become a contributor to the eradication of terrorism, to the eradication of fear, to the eradication of war on the planet, where human beings actually function as love. 
And as they function as love, they create a whole different world. And when together we start to do that, we prepare ourselves for one of the purposes of this work, and that is to create the best year yet of our eternal lives. We're here to support each and every one of you in doing that. We're delighted and honored to be able to share these tools with you. Please have the best year yet of your eternal life and pass it on. Blessings.